Hi, everybody. So today we are uh, lucky enough to get a chance to talk to somebody I'm sure everybody knows, uh, copywriter Bob Bly. Um, Bob is talking to us from his home uh, in, the, in the States, although here in Paris. We're, um, we have lots of things that we could talk about. Uh, Bob has been a copywriter for a very long time. Uh, Bob's copywriter handbook launched, I think, many copywriting careers, in, including mine. Um, and uh, he's a prolific speaker, and uh, he has uh, a large mailing list of people who read his blog posts, news, e-letters. Uh, but one of the things that he's become most famous for is having written um, not just many good books, but very many books total uh, over his career. And uh, over 100 now, I think? Oh, it's over 100. Over 100. Uh, on all different kinds of subjects. And um, I'm sure published in all different kinds of ways. And I thought today it would be interesting to talk to Bob about that process, how he comes up with the ideas, how he gets them published, and uh, what's, what's in it, why publish, uh, which is a, <laughs> something that Bob suggests we talk about, which I think is a very good idea. Um, so Bob, uh, why don't we just start with, with talking about maybe how this began for you, all these writing these books. Sure. The uh, first job I had out of college, which was in 1979, was as a technical writer for Westinghouse Electric Corporation. And while I was there, I noticed, John, you're oh, familiar with the books, Trunk and, The Elements of Style by Strunk and White? Of course, yeah. So yeah. while I was there, I realized there are a lot of questions in technical writing that naturally Strunk and White didn't address because they were, they were not about that. So I uh, decided, I said, what about doing a Strunk and White for technical writers? And I came up with the idea, the elements of technical writing. I had moved to New York, so this was like in 1981, and uh, I met a literary agent and he said he liked the idea he had me write a book proposal, which is something I didn't know about, but he showed me what to do and sold it to the first publisher we talked, talk, he showed it to, sold it to the first publisher he, he, he showed it to, McGraw-Hill, and it was published in 1982. And that is how I got started. And what's, I guess, relevant of that, my, my first compulsion, it's not my only compulsion it, for writing books, is to, once I learn something, I feel compelled to share it with other people. And for some, some of us that's speaking, for some of us that's online classes, for me, my, I gravitate toward the book. So is that, is the book, uh, The Elements of Technical Writing, is that still around? Is it the still Elements in of techni Technical Writing was published in 1982 and it is still in print today. That's amazing, it's amazing. So I, I, I actually, I was taking a look, I'm just gonna share this screen here. Um, I was taking a look at some of the of the many books that you have just posted up on on Amazon. Uh, I guess if I, I don't know if I click all formats, everything will show. Maybe um, you have so many different uh, so many books that are about uh, writing, about selling, about the information business, content marketing. You have your uh, digital marketing, freelance writing. Big. This is your new one. The big. Book of Words itself. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, so many of those books are in the fields where you're working, like this technical writing uh, thing, but not all of them. So some of them are actually, uh, you, have, you have a lot of trivia books. Uh, I see. I've got half a dozen pop culture trivia books. And uh, here's, here's a science book, Charles Steinmetz's right. biography of a scientist. Yeah, that was a, a, a very interesting, I, I went down a kind of a Wikipedia rabbit hole about that guy after I saw your reference there. Mm -hmm. um, I saw you have, you. I know you've done some science fiction. You have, a, you have a book that looks like it's from the early 80s about two kids programming a robot to yeah, clean their room. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, two kids, it's a children's book called Ronald's right. Dumb Robot. And also the science fiction you mentioned, I had a few years ago, uh, Will Driver, which is a medium-sized publisher here in the States, published a book of my science fiction short stories. 
Um, so, yeah. do, you, do you, have you published all of these through a publisher? I have published, well, if you look at the books of mine that are paper bound, that are physical books, uh, 90, over 90% 90 are through a traditional mainstream publisher and uh, probably 95% and maybe half a dozen are not what the other half dozen is I have an e as you mentioned I have a a weekly e newsletter and I collect uh, the best of those articles and every year or two put them out as a, as another collection a book and I have half a dozen of those so those uh, I would not be able to sell to my publishers and so I put them out the easiest way possible which is uh, on Amazon in Kindle and CreateSpace. And so you, that's, that's self-published? Yeah, those, those are self-published by me. Um, so uh, w the ideas that you get for these books, um, how do you, so clearly the technical writing one came out of your experience of being a technical writer and seeing a void there, um, but you have so many of these other, other books. Do you, do you, um, do you brainstorm getting the books? Is there some process that you use to get these ideas or you just? Yeah, I just, uh, in fact, uh, wrote uh, an issue of my e-newsletter, which went out last week, where you know, I said the first step is you need to get the book idea. And I gave the, the main, the primary ways I get it, which are three. Number one, like with, as with the technical writing book, I've learned something. I'm not a master of it, but I've learned something and I now want to share what I know as far as that goes. Doesn't mean I'm the top expert, but I want to share what I know with others, which was the technical uh, writing book, uh, you know, how to create irresistible offers, the copywriter's handbook. The second one is that it's something that I become interested in and want to write about. And the best example of that is my biography of uh, scientist Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who developed the, uh, the US electric grid along with Tesla, Westinghouse, and Edison. And the third one is publishers at this point and have for many years will contact me and say, would you be interested in writing a book? So the one you see up on the screen, the words you should know to sound smart, wasn't my idea. Adams Media came to me and said, would you write it? And I, I was interested and I did it. So you, um, you have an agent that helps you do that or they just know, have, they know you now, they've worked with you for no, a No, no, I time. have, I primarily work with a literary agent. And so the uh, agent handles these deals and contracts for me. Occasionally, I write a book for a publisher that's a smaller independent and tells me, you know, we, we'd rather not have an agent the way we work. We'd rather not have an agent. So maybe half a dozen of my books, I dealt with the publisher directly. I have one publisher in particular that, you know, I'm, I'm, they're smaller. Uh, I'm very, I'm so personally friendly with uh, my editor that we, you know, we can pick up the phone and discuss it. And if they like it, they'll send me a contract. And for him, I don't bother to go through the agent, but normally I tell people who want to write a book, it is better to use a literary agent than not have one. And how do you, how do you go about getting an agent? There yeah. are, uh, I actually have a book that tells this. It's called, uh, it's called How to Write a Book or something like that, How to Write a Book and Get It Published. It's sold on Amazon. And there's several different ways to get an agent, but the main one is there's a website which the nature of the URL escapes me. Uh, this, it's for the Society of Authors Representatives, and that's uh, an organization that a lot of literary agents are a member of. So you can go on there and search for an agent. You can go to a writer's conference, and there are always agents there who make time to sit down with people and, and let the, uh, the, the wannabe or the potential author tell them their idea, and if they like it, that they may go further with you. Um, the way I used to do it is I would find, I would go to Barnes & Noble, and I'd find a book that was reached a similar audience 
in sort of the same niche area that the book I wanted to write was. And I look, I find one of those books in Barnes and Noble and I look in the acknowledgements and seven out of 10 times the author thanked his agent. So I figured if the agent represented this book and sold it, he might be a good match for me. And so I, you know, I tell people you can contact him that way. Say, hey, you know, I just read uh, Larry Joe's book, blah, 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 and see that you're the agent. I'm also a, a writer on topic X and I have something that might interest you and you go on from there. My first agent though was uh, when I wrote the first book, The Elements of Technical Writing, I did it with a co-author and he had already published one book and he knew the literary publishing world and he got went out and got us the agent. It was the first agent we went to, right. you know, what heard the idea said yes, but he, he did that for me and we stayed with him for many years. I would have stayed with him forever, but uh, my co-author, I think you know who he was, Gary Blake, who passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Wasn't the easiest guy in the world and he got into a little kerfuffle, as Judge Judy would say, with Dominic. So, you know, since Gary and I were linked, he wanted to change agents, I didn't, but you know, that's that happens sometimes. Um, so, so when you're when you're talking about this whole process, of course, you're you're saying that, uh, roughly speaking, you come up with the idea, go to the agent, pitch the idea, get the interest, and then once you've got interest in it, you start writing the book. You come up with a plan. Here's what I'd say: it's close. But first, you come up with the idea, but then you vet the idea. You can do that by yourself. And there's a series of questions uh, you ask about the idea it's only like four or five that you can answer on your own. And depending on the answer, you'll say, hey, this, this has potential or this would be difficult or impossible to sell. So you come up with the idea, you vet the idea, then you write a book proposal. You don't write, you don't write the book, you write the book proposal. You, you find an agent, if the agent's interested in the idea in you, you send them the proposal. And if they say, yes, I'd like to represent it, then they take it and attempt to sell it to a publisher. That's how it works. So, and the speed of the idea that you produce these is, uh, I guess it it's certainly gonna vary according to topic and scope. Um, At, but, yeah, absolutely. So how, how long do you say, say you're gonna write, um, and some of these questions, by the way, I know we're jumping the gun for people who haven't even figured out how to what idea they have or if they want to book, you know, write a book or why they might might want to do it. But uh, so say you were going to produce a 150, 200 page book on a nonfiction topic, something something where you already have expertise. Is, is it possible even to guess how long that would take? It's difficult for me to say, because as you know, John, I am not as many book authors are a full-time book author. Like you, mm. I spend my days right. writing copy for my employer or my client, and therefore, let, I may finish a book in six months, but I'm not sitting there working on it, you know, for All 10. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I do it, you know, at the end of the day when I want to relax after a, a difficult or challenging day of dealing with clients and copywriting, I settle down and work on the book for an hour or two. Uh, I would say that, though, in publishing, they typically give you these days, like if you look at any of the books that you're looking at uh, in, on the screen, they typically give you four to seven months to do it. More average is six or seven months. In the mm -hmm. older days, it used to be nine to 12 months, but, you know, things have speeded up today and they don't want to wait that long. However, uh, you know, there are some topics that can just be done more quickly. And there are some topics that for whatever the reason or the, uh, for whatever variety of reasons that you need to get as long as you can get. Right. Well, I, I, as you say that a uh, question pops into my mind thinking in the, in the uh, position of the, of the viewers, which might be uh, about the economics of uh, getting books published, but, I'm just going to mention that and then save that question for when we talk about the why okay. later. Uh, because I, I just want to acknowledge it because I think that people would think about that. Another thing, though, that pops into my 
uh, head that I think would be good to just mention now is that when you're talking about where the ideas come from, I, per I particularly like uh, the, the second one that you suggest where uh, it's where you want to learn something about something new. Uh, because I think, you know, we, we each have our own little expertise uh, or even some have a, a vast expertise. Um, but uh, for me anyway, I, I'm curious about a lot of things of which I know very little. Um, so I like the idea, I guess this also gets into the why as well, but I like the idea of being able to explore something and um, being able to think about it in print because that's just an easier way for me to think. So uh, I think that that's, it should be encouraging for people who want to write a book for reasons that might be other than money um, or fame or all those things that they imagine might come with, with book writing, which is uh, that you can, you don't particularly have to be an expert in the thing that you write about. And I, would you say that that's fair? Yes. As long as, you, as long as you're an expert in researching it and asking questions and finding experts. Someone once wrote, and I think it might, may have been Nick Osborne in his book, which the title of which escapes me. I think he only published one. And he said, there's different ways to come at it. One way is the first way I said is you've learned it. You're the expert as you are, and you are writing as the expert in the subject. But the second way is the way you said, you, you, you tell the reader like you, I'm learning this. So let's long, learn alongside each other. And, uh, you know, it, can, it, it, it gives a different feel and slant and point of view. And uh, other times it's, it, again, it's research. Now, when I wrote my book on Steinmetz, uh, I knew very little about him. And I was not an expert on the uh, US electrical grid because I'm uh, not an electrical engineer, I'm a chemical engineer, but I loved researching it. And it was made a little easier by the fact that I do have an engineering background, so I, I'm, te I'm technically oriented. And that was probably the most, the, the most fun I've had in the last three or four years was writing the Steinmetz book and my science fiction book, which is called Freak Show of the Gods and Other Tales of the Bazaar. So with those two books, um, I, I can't wait, well, there certainly are people out there who like science fiction. And uh, I did, I read your Freak Show of the Gods one. I like that story, especially in the beginning with the, um, the rubber band? Abraham Lincoln oh, robot. Abraham Lincoln, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, I don't remember if that was the beginning. Uh, that might have been in not, not the beginning, but that was a good one. Um, and the the story about, what's his name? Stein? Steinmetz. Charles Proteus Steinmetz. Steinmetz. Yeah. So um, probably not a huge fan base of people out there. No. looking for that guy. Um, so uh, would you ever advise anybody to, you know, the, in the days where now where it's easier to self-publish and things like that, would you ever recommend somebody just to go ahead and write a book, to write the book? Yeah, I mean, people do that all the time. Some people write it just to write it. They don't actually care if it's published. Many more people in that, in that boat would say, yeah, I'm gonna write it. And then I'm going to, in some form or another, self-publish it. And you can do traditional self-publishing or you can do Kindle and CreateSpace, which is uh, easier, but not as profitable. Or, uh, and I would, I would never not recommend that. My preferred mode of publishing, because this is how I was brought up. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm older than you. And I, I again, I started, I wrote my first book in 81 and published it in 82. And back then the world was mostly you go to a publisher and they publish. Right. Yes, there was Dan Pointer, who, who was a friend of mine all those years and he taught self-publishing. And so, so it, was uh, mainly, were... it was mainly traditional publishing. And then the right. outlier or the exception was self-publishing, which a lot of people did and swore by, but that was not, the, but I was brought up in the mainstream publishing world which I like, it suited me, it still suits me today. And so I never left it. Um, and uh, today, well, say, so for instance, just as an example, I, we've had uh, email exchanges. I've, I spent some time collecting some of my copywriters roundtable things into a book. 
right. uh, had to had to do that kind of in the way that you were describing, you know, an hour hour here and there. Um, and I wasn't exactly disciplined about it. So it took a good long while. And then I mentioned it in my e-letter that I had finished it. And somebody, uh, um, Alan Forrest Smith, you know, a uh, copywriter in the UK, is a publishing right. house. And he had, he wrote to me and he said, look, I'll, I'll publish it sight unseen. Wow. And just, I want to get some other uh, writers in my, in my uh, group and things like that. And I, I thought about it and I still am thinking about it. Um, but he had, he said, oh, you know, I, I won't kid you. I, there's mostly it would just be published, uh, through my thing, but we, you know, you'd have to market it on your own through the, through the e-letter and, um, you know, it just, started, so there's a lot of stuff that I have, would have to do on my own. And, there is for any author though. I mean, Stephen yeah. King, who is the automatic best-selling author, you read, you read articles about him. He has a new book hamlet come out, he gets on his Harley and he took tours the country, stopping <laughs> everywhere to, to right. get bookstores. So everyone does it. Right. Well, so I thought, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do it anyway, maybe I should look into self-publishing things. There's a, something called draft to digital. I don't, I that mean, I'm not familiar with, but there's a lot of self-publishing platforms out there. Um, and they seem like they'll go and distribute you, uh, digitally at least, to all the different outlets. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm still, still thinking about it, but definitely the landscape has changed as far as oh, the, yeah. the route. Yeah. So, nice. but let's switch gears for a second. And I just want to ask you before we get off the ideas and the, uh, uh, for coming up with the book and anything, what your writing process is when you are writing, you mentioned that you need to squeeze it in around your, your day job, so to speak. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the one. But when people ask me about the writing process, I always say I use the file folder method. And they go, what is that? What I do is I write the table of contents for the book first. That is going to be part of your book proposal. And I write it as detailed as possible. More so than I think even a publisher or agent would require. Why? Because when I sit, when I finally start to write the book and get my contract, it's going to be easier. So I, I put together the table of contents. I print it out, and I, with a scissor, I, I cut out each chapter title and the five or seven bullets under it, and I, pay, I paste it. I take each one to a Manila file folder. Then I put all those Manila file folders in a Pentaflex file folder with the name of the book. Now I've got a file on the book. I've got twelve separate folders, each with the chapter title and the information. And now as I am working and I start finding stuff uh, on the topic, which is what happens, you know, you, you mm -hmm. decide to write a book. So suddenly you realize you're getting tons of stuff on this, you know, almost every day. I right. drop, I drop the content into the file folder. And so when I sit down to write, you know, I, I've already done, you know, 80% of my research. So I use the file folder method, which is not original to me. Right. And then uh, when you're, when you're written it out, you go back and you make several passes through and clean it up or. Yeah. Here's what I do. I um, take at the same time, I take that table of contents and I put it in a file that's actually the book file and I spread it out using the space bar and bold face the name of each chapter title, chapter five, chapter seven, and then spread uh, the uh, bullets, which I turn into s subheads, and then I start filling in. Now, sometimes I'll deviate from this, but that's the basic method I use. And yes, once I uh, write the book, I will definitely, I will definitely do, uh, actually, I do it by the chapter. I'll write a chapter and I'll polish it. Uh, you know, there are some authors that say they only do a first draft and that's it. And there aren't that many. I think Robert Heinlein, uh, you know, the, the science fiction guy, Star, you know, Starship Trooper, I think he said he only did a first draft. Uh, Isaac Asimov did uh, a first draft and then corrected it uh, with a pen, but didn't really do a, a major redraft. But no, I, 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 like we do with copywriting, I don't right. polish it to the degree that you and I would polish a, a, a Magalog or, you know, a landing page, but I do rewrite and polish it. I like to, I've been told by publishers, 
you know, certainly not the greatest author in the world, but publish it. My editors have said to me, you hand in very clean manuscripts, which they really like. Yeah, I imagine. I, I, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting part of the writing process, too, that um, I, when you're first starting out, you hate the idea of having to go back and edit your own stuff. But I actually enjoy the editing process a little more than the writing process, I think, because all the research, most of the research is done, unless you come up with some new idea that needs added support. Right. Um, and now you can go through and you can find the thread that you wanted originally and weed out the stuff that kind of leaked in. I, I had an interesting experience just the other day with a piece of uh, long sales copy where the uh, I was writing for financial newsletters um, and the editor uh, asked if we could do a cold read through for mm -hmm. the VSL. And, right. and I haven't had a re I haven't had an editor ever offer to do that, but um, neither have I. I said sure, sure, because it was it was going to be an interview style. So I played the interviewer, and he he gave the answers. And uh, I thought it was going to mostly be helpful for him because he would get used to saying the things he had to say on camera and feel natural and things like that. But what it did was hearing another voice, and I had already edited it a, a few times, mm -hmm. but hearing another voice read it, um, I, I stopped it and I thought, you know, that's kind of an awkward way to say that, or it doesn't exactly sound like you. And it was very helpful. And uh, I ended up changing quite a bit. Yeah, I always believe in second opinions, and I don't know if I've told you this, but you know Elise Bennett from AWA, yeah. right? She is sure. actually, and has been for many years, decades, on retainer to me. And what I use her for, uh, one of the things is when I've written the first page of, let's say, a VSL or a, a Magalog or a long copy sales letter, first page, page and a half to lead, I email it to her and I get, a, I get her read on it. So I always get, uh, you know, I always vet it with at least one other person. And some people say, well, you, you should find a copywriting buddy and then do it on an exchange basis. But because I'm paying her, I can get it done in the swift manner in which I need it done. You know, I can't always wait right. a week. And so this has worked out very well for me. And I've had her do that with, uh, you know, occasionally with the book intros too. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I've heard really people suggest well. doing that with a, with a spouse, but I, I can... No, I, I, want, to stay, I, I want to stay married. Yeah, I just can imagine. Uh, well, for one, uh, I know my wife would be too busy doing, she has a lot of other things that she's doing. Um, and I would be there kind of eagerly waiting for the feedback. Um, and for two, it, you know, becomes like a, a personal discussion. Why don't you like it, you know? <laughs> so That's exactly. Right. You, you know, normally, you and I are mature enough that when we right. get criticisms or crits, as Clayton used to call them, we, we take them seriously. But when it's your spouse, you, you feel like you want to argue with them. Right. Is, it's personal. <laughs> yeah. Which is the total wrong thing to do. So, right. yeah. So, I use Elise. Um, that's a very good idea. So, we actually, we did kind of talk about the second aspect was about uh, getting it published. Um Maybe we could talk about then you say you are down the road, your book is finished, you've turned it into the publisher um, or you've self published it either way uh, and you've got a you've got the as close to final as you're going to get, whether it's a an ebook, a Kindle book with a nice cover and layout um, that's just going to be online or something that's going to show up in bookstores. What then about marketing it? I mean we're, we're you people like you and me who have the e-letter lists and uh, and um, along those lines do have an advantage of that as an outlet, the e-letter. Um, and we are day job marketers. So what is it you do uh, for your book or is that something your publisher handles or how does it go? You get on your motorcycle, you go and uh, join Stephen King. Uh I tried to, but he said, get, he said, get away from me. So I had to turn around and go back. But, uh, you know, I do, uh, here what, what I say, when you go with a traditional publisher, you would think that they would do it all, but they do very little. It just, it's the economics of book publishing. How much can they spend on each book that they put out? So right. you, you are responsible for, for the bulk of it. And, uh, 
what I do is uh, another thing I mentioned, the least I have, I don't know if you know this, I have one full-time employee. She doesn't work in my office, but you know, it's a, it's a virtual, she works in a virtual office and you know, she works for me again, full-time 40 hours a week. Someone, you know, when it's book time, I say, Jody, often, often the publishers today will send you a list of things. Hey, here's what we would hope you would be doing. And boom, I send it to Jody and said, get this done, get these done. When you need my help, let me know. Otherwise just do them. And uh, so I, you know, I have, I outsource that to my employee because unfortunately uh, you know, for guys like us who have a, a, a full-time day job, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to do all that you should do um, because you have, you have other responsibilities. So I solved that by outsize, outsourcing the vetting or the reading to Elise and the marketing to Jody. Yeah, I have been in, I have been in touch uh, with Jody on yeah, you know, things I know you before. Jody. Right. Yeah. So, um, but you uh, say, say somebody is not established as established in this whole process as you are. Um, you know, we're say we're writing to somebody who just wants to, uh, I, for instance, I heard from a CR reader who, um, she puts out some gardening books mm -hmm. every now and then. She, or she put out a few. In fact, she's the one who drafted digital. Right. Um, probably not going to hire a full-time marketing oh, employee. Of course not. Uh, I imagine that there are ways to contract out somebody temporary to help. Absolutely. Um, you can outsource any, you know this, you can outsource yeah. anything today. So for example, and some of these are listed on uh, my site, bly.com, if you go to the vendors page, for example, if you go to bly.com, click on vendors and go book publicity, there are book publicists that you can outsource the promotion to the, of your book to the media to. So there's, you know, there's outsourcing for that. There's a, there's a company that I found recently, I've never even heard of them before, that you outsource what they will do is get you on as many relevant podcasts as a guest as you know, as you, as they can, they can get you. And that's a great right. service. And I do do for my books, uh, a fair amount of podcasting as guests, as a guest on other people's podcasts. But, uh, but that just happens because people know me and they call me, but, or they email me, but you know, you can outsource that. So you can outsource right. book publicity, podcasting, you can outsource getting on radio interviews. There's all sorts of things you can do. Yeah, and it's it seems and it seems like it, it seems like today that, that it's a great idea because uh, you know that the impulse to to DIY everything's uh, noble in some regard but um, again this is probably something that somebody would be doing in addition to a day job or in addition to some other busy aspects of life um, but also it just uh, sometimes it's just smarter to use somebody else's expertise if you can. Yeah, I mean, it's smarter. Like if you want to be on podcasts, you probably get some and you can contact them. But right. these guys have a list, a comprehensive database of like for every podcast on every subject in the known universe. So they're ready to do it. It's so much, they'll not only will they save you time, but they'll do it much better than you would. Yeah, sure. Well, this That's is the thing. do. Yeah, this is the Tim Ferriss secret. This is how he gets to the to the four hour work week. He outsources everything. Yeah, so. I'm very I'm very big on that. I wrote a book yeah. uh, on uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of even the called Make Every Second Count on personal productivity, and I you know that's a chapter yeah. in the book. And I've always believed that outsource. And I tell people, do I believe in outsourcing? Yeah, there's the book. Uh, here's here's the answer. I haven't been to the post office in 24 years. I hire someone <laughs> to go. I outsource everything. I haven't cut my lawn in 30 years. You know? Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. And it, it's not, uh, it's not something that, that you have to be, you know, a, a multi-jillionaire to do. You're not at all. Because people are out there willing to do, uh, willing to do things, willing to, to have somebody uh, take a chance on them or, you know, you might say you get what you pay for, but. Um, there are a lot of very skilled people out there who are Absolutely. willing to do stuff. Absolutely. Uh, I met a guy through a, an employment firm that was looking to 
uh, he wants to do some writing and I won't mention his name and, and he, he needs a start in life because he, he's a very intelligent guy. He has cerebral mm -hmm. palsy. And I have a, my first cousin, Phil, has cerebral palsy, so I'm very empathetic. And so we started uh, recommending him to clients and they're all delighted with him. Yeah, I had a guy uh, some years ago ask me if, if I had any writing assignments for him. He was a, a, a budding copywriter and um, he lived in Kenya. I've and had that. I've had that too. Go ahead. And he wrote to me, and I and I said, well, I can't, I don't can't think of anything right now. But then I thought, well, you know, I keep meaning to put together this report on how to get big ideas, and you know, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll send him some of the articles that I've written over the years and uh, on a basic outline and and see what happens. And he put it together, and he did such a nice job. Uh, and it was so much longer than I thought. I thought, well, eventually I'll turn this thing into a book. Now I I paid him for it. Uh, not very much money. Um, I think it was a couple hundred bucks. And I forgot about it. Well, I just dug it up about a month ago and sent it to, uh, I, I think I held on to it because I thought, well, I'll go, I'll copy edit and make sure it's all clean. And uh, then I decided to outsource that um, and got somebody to do the copy editing. So now I have another little book that's ready to go. And that's like my favorite situation on the planet where you realize you have this asset, like a report or a book you wrote years ago, and you forgot about it. And you right. look at it and you go, this is good. I've had that happen with, um, you know, your books eventually, or most of them, will go out of print. And sometimes when, when you've written over 100, you forget about them. And then you, you're looking at, you know, I'm in the living room looking at the bookcase. I go, wait a minute, that, people still want that. Well, that's been out of print for 15 years. I own the rights to it. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like finding a free treasure. <laughs> right. So maybe we could uh, now maybe answer that question. Why, why would, why would you write books? You have a, a enormously successful copywriting career. Um, I have a, a very successful copywriting career. Uh, yet I feel this compulsion to write uh, a couple of business, I think I'd like to write another, maybe four or five business related books. Um, I have a couple of nonfiction book ideas and I have a couple of fiction book ideas, none of which I'm interested in writing because I think they're going to make me rich and famous. Mm -hmm. So what is that compulsion for you? I know what the answer is for me, but. Well, there are four basic reasons. One is as number one is compulsion or addiction. I am a book person. If people knew how much time I spent with books, because when I'm done writing them, I, I walk, you know, 80 feet to the living room, plop in a chair and start reading them, other people's books. So I am a book addict and therefore it is an addiction and compulsion. I, that's my thing. I just have to do it. And I know for some people, that, that's not their thing. They're just as happy uh, doing a webinar or giving a talk. I want to write a book. So number two is, uh, number one is addiction. Number three is, again, related to that, the compulsion to teach others what I know. I mean, I don't know that much and I'm not that smart, but when I think I've learned something to the point where it would be useful for others to know, I can't keep it under my hat. I want to, and maybe, you know, I overestimate myself, but I, I, I put it out as a book and, uh, you know, the, the reaction is generally that you know, people say, th you know, thanks for making this available. We find it helpful. The number third, the three reason, the third reason is self-serving to me. Uh, one of the way everybody, like you're a very successful copywriter and all of us build our businesses in, in different ways. Uh, you know, you, I leave it up to you whether mm -hmm. you want to say how you got where you are. I, I, I think I know. But one of the ways I did it was I, I wrote books uh, that ended up, I didn't, and that was, this wasn't the reason to write them. Like one of the early books I wrote was the copywriter's handbook, which you mentioned. So, um, which is shown on the screen, second to the left, that's a new edition. So I, mm -hmm. I wrote it in 84, it was published in 85. And I don't know if you remember, but the, the publisher 
said, let's send some galleys out to people for comments. So I put names of people I knew, Mark Ford, uh, you know, um, Rich Sheffrin, whoever, but not Rich Sheffrin, but you know, whoever it was. And then mm -hmm. I put randomly David Ogilvy. They sent it to <laughs> Ogilvy. He didn't know me. And he sent back this beautiful, a complimentary jacket blurb, which literally that, which happened in 85, ex boosted and accelerated my career. So wow. it, 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 yeah. it, it, it can help establish your reputation as a good vendor, a good expert in your field. And the fourth is a formula which people forget. They say, oh, book, you know, publishing books with a traditional publisher doesn't pay. But what they don't understand is this formula. TBR equals DBR plus IBR, which means total book revenue equals direct book revenue, which is the advance you get from the publisher and the re royalties you collect uh, you know, every three or six months, plus indirect book revenue. And if we had the time, I'd, I'd tell a story about this, but you know, sometimes that indirect book revenue can be incredibly uh, much more than you got paid by the publisher and the book buyers for your book. Is by that you mean the revenue you get from somebody reading that book and then hiring you to do something? Yes, that's yeah. mainly, I mean, there are other sources, but it's mainly someone, uh, you know, indirectly, uh, uh, you know, reading the book and then hiring you. But, uh, you know, there are other things that, that happen on an ancillary basis. For example, I, I, I wrote this up in my e-newsletter a few months ago. A few months ago, I, I get a royalty check uh, and it's for $12,850 for the copywriter's handbook for the Chinese edition, which until then I had no <laughs> idea they even had. So I called really? my agent and he goes, oh, don't, don't you remember that? You, you signed that like a year ago, they published it. So, you know, you get, you know, that that's almost <laughs> indirect. You know, I didn't write a, Ch a book for the Chinese market, but you know, yes, it's mainly, as you said, uh, people hiring you because they read the book and they say, we want you to do X for us. Right. Yeah. I, I recently, uh, I recently was in touch with a, a friend who's uh, American, but is working down in, in uh, Brazil. And, um, and I met with a, a colleague of his who was, uh, who's a, a Brazilian copywriter who happened to be traveling through Paris, the two of them uh, working together for the same company, which is associated with the financial publishing company at Gore that I do a lot of work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, that he wanted when this covid thing is over that he wanted to try and get me to come down there and give a seminar and i said right. well f for one i don't speak portuguese but uh you know i <laughs> and i don't know when that'll be but i i'm not sure why people down in in uh, rio would want to hear from me and they're like you've got to be kidding you're you're, at, you're actually kind of famous down here and i had no idea. i said how could that be and he said well you're your great leads book is really popular in, uh, in the Brazilian marketing wow. community. And he showed me a copy of it and I had never seen the cover of it before. It was all in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I said, I wasn't aware that we were publishing yeah. it down there. And he said, well, yeah. he said, you aren't exactly, uh, it, it's been pirated and oh. republished by somebody down there. Well, that so, yeah. right. So it was, it was very interesting to me. Yeah, and the other reason why they would want you, not just because of your book, is it's a weird thing, and you may have noticed this, in professional speaking, where you get paid to give a talk, the farther you are from where you're going to give the talk, the more they want, they're willing, the higher the fee they're willing to pay you. Right. For example, I'll get, I, I'm here in Jersey, so when I get a call from the Jersey Ad Club, they assume I'm going to go there for free. Yeah, they'll give you lunch. Yeah, but I got I to, gotta, yeah, exactly. But I got a call, you know, a couple of years ago from a software company in Italy and to do a, a one day seminar. Now it's really not one day because you got to travel there and come back. Right. But to do a one day seminar, I got $10,000, which is more than my usual fee. Right. So I, it certainly could be a, uh, it can be a career boosting um, investment. Yeah. I mean, look at yeah. the, yeah. I mean, uh, you look at some of the people out there. Uh, Dr. Ruth, for example, 
you know, got famous because of her sex books. Now, sometimes right. people are on TV and they can write books because they're famous. Other times people write books and that makes them famous and, and, and opens up other opportunities for them. Right. And I, 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 saw, I saw an interesting article uh, today about something that Steve Jobs had said. It was a kind of a, a clickbaity uh, title. I think it was in mm -hmm. Inc. Magazine or something like that. But uh, the one thing that he recommends that people do that most people don't do. Uh, which was what it, what it really boiled down, boiled down to was just trying something. And what, what most people don't do is just go ahead and, and try to do something and see what happens because um, people talk themselves out of attempting something new, something interesting. And I, I think that this is what happens a lot with uh, say writing a book, there are a lot of people that have an idea that they want to write about in the book. Um, same as there are a lot of people that want to start a business, some people want to start a, a e-letter or anything like that, uh, or try their hands at being a freelance copywriter. But the difference often isn't the skill or the intelligence of the person doing it, um, but the willingness to just take a shot. That's exactly true. And May Sarton, I don't know if you know that name, who's a, who's a, I don't know if she's still alive, wonderfully fine poet and a memoir writer. Uh, her first book, I think, was A House by the Sea, which is wonderful. She said, and I never forgot it, she said, many, many people want to have written a book. Very few actually want to write one. <laughs> that is probably a good uh, point to end on. So, yes. uh, uh, Bob, thank you very much. I, I know I said we were going to do about half an hour, and I think we've done almost double that. But uh, it's my it pleasure. Very, very interesting. It's always good to talk to you. Same here. And uh, hopefully, one of these days when travel bans lift, uh, I'll see you in Delray. In Delray, or if if you ever come over to Paris, I know you're not a you're not big on planes traveling, <laughs> but. Uh, but, uh, and also here's your, we didn't get too much of a chance to talk about your new book, but I'm going to plug it anyway. This is the, the big book of words that sell. And uh, you can go to um, the, this page. Yeah, it's www.bly.com forward slash sales. And you can get and a I'll, free chapter here. I will post, I'll post that in my e-letter uh, that, that has this video and I'll also put it up in the description of the YouTube thing. And you can click on this uh, gain instant access now and it will take you right to this page, which is a sample chapter. So, yes. um, which I thought I found very interesting. So well, what's I, interesting I, is I, didn't, I didn't invent this. This is a standard book landing page format. That is right. Dan Kennedy's invention. And I, <clears throat> I got to this, um, to this thing and I, I found myself going through this list of teaser uh, ideas for words that sell and, and thinking of headlines and things like that. So it got me pulled in right away. Great. So it's good stuff. Well, so uh, Bob, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, hope you and your family and everybody fare well and I hope to talk to you real soon. Thank you.